the question is how many fives are there? And what what is what must we not forget? There's, there's a slight trick to this question. It's not only the number of fives. What else must we remember? Well, it's all about the number of fives, but um, there are certain special numbers that have more than one five attached to them, don't they? So what are those numbers? Powers of five. Powers of five, yeah. So numbers like 25 and 50 and, tw and 75 and 100 have two fives attached to them, don't they? And then there's numbers with three fives attached to them, which, which would be multiples of? One, two, five, and then numbers with four fives attached to them, which would be multiples of six, two, five, and then I think we've been reached it. All right, so um, so work out the number of fives from 2016 prime factorized. So if you divide by five, it gives you the, the total number of multiples of five. Okay, so that's 203. But if you divide by 25, that gives you 80 multiples of 25, and each of those 25s adds one five onto the total. And then, uh, how many one, two, fives are there? There's 16, so they add another 16 onto the total. And then 65, there are three, they add another three onto the total. So there should be, I've done it right, and if I haven't, you can edit it. Um, it's 502 zeros at the end of 2016. Okay. Sequences. Okay, we do sequences traditionally in grade 11, I, I would say, mostly. Most people, or grade 12 even. I think in the national curriculum for statements, it's actually done in the start of grade 12. But sequences are so important. And if you're a grade 10 or a grade 11 writing in third round, there are certain things that you really need to know as basic knowledge. Okay, so here's one. The, the sum of an arithmetic sequence. But we, you do arithmetic sequences from grade 8. Okay, so it's numbers of the form a plus n minus 1d, or numbers with a, co a sequence with a constant difference. But you may not be familiar with summing a whole lot of those numbers. So that's n over 2, 2a plus n minus 1d, where a is the first term and d is the common difference. Okay, standard, standard stuff. A geometric sum, uh, that's a number with a con constant ratio. The sum of those numbers would be um, a, the first term, times r to the n minus 1 over r minus 1, uh, where r is the common ratio, uh, and so that would be just standard knowledge. Sum to infinity, so if you've got a geometric sequence uh, where the common ratio lies between minus 1 and 1, when you add up an infinite number of those terms, you will get a finite value, and, and the finite value is a over 1 minus r. The sum of squares, if you do AP maths, you will be, how many of you do AP maths? Good, fantastic, well, perhaps it goes with doing Olympiads. Um, sum of R's, the sum of the square numbers, it's not a, I mean, it's not a, it's on the formula sheet and maybe you kind of look at it and you think, okay, great, I know I need to use it for even sums, but I'll kind of just forget about it otherwise. But actually it's a very useful formula. Adding up the square numbers, n, n plus 1, 2, n plus 1, and 6. Then adding up cubic numbers is n squared n plus 1 or squared over 4, which happens to be the square of the sum of the integers, which is an interesting result. Okay, so I've just added that in there. The sum of the integers, of course, is n n plus 1 over 2, right, which is over, over the page here. So just simple stuff. I know this is, this is quite simple, but I, I, I think that it's not necessarily obvious to everyone sitting here. Uh, that these are things that you should just know off by heart. Okay? Sum of integers, n n plus 1 over 2. Sum of odd numbers is a square number, so that's n squared. And then sum of a geometric sequence uh, of, of terms of x, which we use for finance, for annuities, which you will study in either grade 11 or grade 12. x to the n plus 1 over minus 1 over x minus 1. But now, if you rearrange that formula, you get this nice sort of factorization formula. So, for example, if you want to factorize x to the 5 minus 1, x minus 1 will always be a factor of x to the n minus 1, and then uh, you get that sort of sequence of powers of x uh, in the second bracket. So that's, that's, uh, that bottom thing there is a very useful factorization technique, okay? just by rearranging the, uh, the, the statement above. All right, all good stuff to remember. Some useful algebra. Okay, there's a thing called the factor theorem. And uh, we kind of breeze over it really, really quickly in grade 12. 
um, without paying much attention so that we can factorize cubic equations, but then most people forget about it because why the calculator will factorize a cubic for you anyway. So the vast majority of students don't even worry about the factor theorem. But it is very useful. Basically, what it says is if you substitute uh, into a polynomial, you substitute in a value and it gives you zero, then x minus that value is a factor of that polynomial, an algebraic factor of that polynomial. All right, so if f of a equals naught for a polynomial f of x, then x minus a is a factor of that polynomial. If you don't get zero, that number you do get is the remainder when you divide that polynomial by x minus that number. Okay, so that is useful algebra. So this is something that I would I think would be assumed by all people setting Olympiads. You would know this. Um, but it's not done thoroughly in school. So here we go, let's consider this. I'm going to give you an example. Alright, so here's a power four. Would you be able to solve that equation? Well, usually people run a mile when they see power four equations as up. No, I'll use my calculator and use the solve function. The only problem with the solve function is it only gives you one answer. So here we go. Let's see how we can do it without a calculator. The first thing is we're going to look for factors. We're going to look for numbers which we can substitute. Of course, it depends entirely on being able to. There are, there are small numbers that actually work. But given that there probably will be in an Olympiad situation, they're not going to expect you to, to find a factor where you have to substitute in 259 or something like that. But there will be small numbers. So notice that f of 3 and, uh, and f of minus 1 give you 0, which means that both x equals 3 and x minus 1 are solutions, and therefore x minus 3 and x plus 1 are factors. Therefore, the product of them is also a factor. And that, that tells us that x squared minus 2x minus 3 is a factor, an algebraic factor of x to the 4 minus 2x cubed minus x squared plus 10 to the 2 d. So that's really useful because now by inspection I can say x squared minus 2x minus 3 times what will give me that expression. And it's easy to see that it will be x squared just by multiplying out terms. Um, it will be x squared minus 5. And therefore, the other two solutions our x squared minus 5 equals 0, and therefore we get x is plus or minus 3 prime. Right, so something like I saw, as I was breezing through some um, recent third round, I saw a question where you needed to, to factorize a little bit like that. Um, so it's, it's just a skill. It wouldn't be asked as a question. I mean, that would be too easy. But it would form part of the question. So you don't, look, you don't want to be hamstrung by the fact that you can't solve a power 4 or a power 3 equation. Uh, and you do the rest of the problem. Okay. What else do we? Uh, a partial fractions. Okay. So all of you do AP maths, or most of you do. And if you don't, uh, please uh, enroll in it. Partial fractions. So just to say that if you've got a constant or something ending over uh, a product of linear factors, you can you can separate those into two terms. Okay. So and I'm sure students of your caliber. And who do AP maths will know how to do that. So I'm not going to labor that, but, it, but understand that that's useful information. If you've got a, a repeated root, remember to include each power up to and including that, that power of the original expression. And then if you've got a quadratic uh, expression in the comment which doesn't factorize, then you need a bx plus c term on top. Okay, and that's how, that's basically partial fractions, how they work. Right, and you, you've got to solve for A, B, and C. Again, I'm not going to go into detail. That's something you can look up in your AP Math textbooks if you haven't done it. All right, here's a fun question for you. What's the sum from R equals 1 to 84 of two, root of 2R plus 1 minus root of 2R minus 1 over the root of 4R squared minus 1? I'm going to give you two minutes to think about it. Maybe one minute. And see if you can figure out what to do. I'm really interested in what to do rather than the answer, of course. No
substituting in numbers just just brute force. You do substitute all the part, and you're, you're trying numbers, yes, and do try to do something algebraic with it. Okay, both will work, by the way. You could just go for the numbers. <coughs> But there's a little bit of, if you just go for the numbers, you're going to have to do a bit of manipulation with the numbers that you get. Right, okay. I'm, I'm, I just wanted you to think about it a little bit, but we have to sort of, uh, uh, I have to give the answer. The, the expression simplifies. If you divide both terms by, the, by that denominator, you split the denominator, then you get 1 over root 2r minus 1 minus 1 over root 2r plus 1. Okay? Would you be happy with that? Because remember that the, the denominator factorizes to root of 2r minus 1, 2r plus 1 by difference of squares, doesn't it? So that's the